The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This is what it's all about right here, though, watching all these birds get up. Oop, hen! hen. <laughs> Literally, three feet away from me. That'll get your heart pumping. Well, managing for pheasants is really about more than managing for pheasants. It's, it's managing for all the other species that are going to use those grasslands and that are going to use those wetlands. The open prairie of the Upper Midwest is home and a destination for people who love the outdoors. To hunt, fish, and enjoy outdoor recreation provided by our vast resources of lakes, rivers, trails, and grasslands. Here we connect with the natural world and leave the stresses of our daily lives behind. Hey everybody, welcome to Prairie Sportsman. I'm your host, Brett Amundsen, and this week's episode is dedicated to our love of the ringneck. From pheasant hunting, to late night hen trapping and coloring for research, to joining Chef Kurt in his kitchen as he whips up one of his favorite pheasant recipes. Funding for this project was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources and by American Surplus, Ice Castle Fish House RV, Minnesota's largest manufacturer of premium portable ice fish houses and a proud supporter of the annual February Ice Castle Classic Fishing Tournament. More information at icecastlefh.com. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. In late November, Pheasants Forever hosted a group of Minnesota hunters on a pheasant hunt at the Johansson family farm near Tolstoy, South Dakota, where the landowners are balancing a profitable farming operation with abundant natural habitat for pheasants and other wildlife. The Johansson's 5,000 acre farm supports up to 6,000 pheasants. About 1,000 are harvested every year, and we did what we could to help that number out. A sorghum corn and sorghum on that side. Sorghum is a popular crop to plant for wildlife, particularly pheasants. The fields are easy to walk through, and the stalks are short, so you can see a lot better than you could in other fields like corn. Sorghum also provides the best of both worlds for birds cover that provides shelter from the weather and predators and also a valuable food source. Look at them all getting up. There it is. And... You know they might be getting up a little a little far, a little I wild. We're walking over some too. They're... I'm sure we're passing some. Yeah. yeah. Especially some of these hens that are holding tight. This is what it's all about right here though, watching all these birds get up. Oh, hen. <laughs> Literally, three feet away from me. That'll get your heart pumping. That will get your heart pumping. Those long shots are tough. I mean, you got a probability of maybe knocking them down, but usually when you do, you wing them. Yeah. And, there it is. Uh, nope. Probability of finding them sometimes on those long shots can go down. Sometimes they'll hide so well, you'll walk right next to them. Sometimes, though, they can't hide from a dog's nose. Unless you pick one up. Hold. Hold. What do you got there? Rooster. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Usually they're always hens when they catch them. That's two days in a row she's picked up a rooster. And it's, it's fun to watch a dog pick up a bird like that. You don't see it with roosters very often. But that right there shows you what these birds are doing when you got this much snow on the ground. And she stuck her head in the snow and came out with the bird. That's a good dog right there. He says, you don't worry about shooting. I'll handle it. Rooster, rooster! Pheasants aren't the only upland game bird in South Dakota. You'll also find Hungarian partridge and prairie grouse like prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse, or sharpies. We walked a mixture of food plot strips and cattail sloughs during our trip to South Dakota, 
finding pheasants in each spot. That's part of what I like about hunting this time of year. Sure, it's cold and there's a lot of snow, but generally, you'll know where to look to find birds. Find food and cover, and you'll be in the right neighborhood. Now, there's no question we want to find roosters when we hunt, but we'll take an afternoon of watching the dogs work and flushing hens at close range. It still gets the adrenaline going, and seeing this many hens gives you hope for the future. We also spent some time in the public lands nearby to see how they compared. There's got to be some birds in this spot. We got a little secluded cattail slough here. Dog is going crazy. We got tracks in front of us. Just heard the loser. There he is. Took me a minute to identify that bird. Well, that rooster got away. But there will be more birds to come, even if some of them are hens. A late season pheasant hunt can be a challenge with cold temperatures and deep snow, but if you can brave the weather and go to an area that has the habitat to hold birds, you should be able to find them. Having a good dog can help too. While these snowdrifts weren't always the easiest to walk through, it's all just another part of the Johansson's plan. Keep stubble in the fields all winter and it will hold that snow and keep it from blowing off. When that snow melts, the ground gets the moisture it will need that spring. Creating habitat isn't just about planting grass and then driving away from it. There are many ways you can provide food and cover for wildlife while still making a living off the land. After the hunt, I talked with our Pheasants Forever host, Anthony Halk of White Bear Lake, Minnesota, who I called the master illusionist. Because you made some pheasants appear. Actually, it wasn't you. It's the Johansson guys at this farm. Talk about how important it is to have a farmer care about wildlife and do what they've done on this property. Well, it's, it's important on uh, probably multiple levels. Number one, they're, they're, just the fact that there's birds here. You know, we got to see that today. They're contributing to wildlife habitat. Uh, they have a great operation. The other part of it that's pretty important is like the Johansson farm is kind of like a model farm for the habitat mosaic. I mean, it's a working farm, they're profitable, they have pheasants, deer, other wildlife, and, and they're better salesmen for that message than almost we are, you know. I asked fourth generation farmer Eric Johansson how they were able to provide so much pheasant habitat and still maintain their bottom line. What you guys do here is you, you kind of find that working balance. You're able to uh, have a, a profitable farming operation and, and grow crops and have that, agri that production agriculture, but also provide habitat. Talk about some of the ways that you do that. Uh, well, we're in a unique uh, geography here where no-till um, works really well for us. So we don't till any of the soil. Um, we leave a lot of the standing uh, crop stubble in the fields. Uh, which provides different habitat, not only nesting habitat in the spring of the year that most people don't think of, but also winter habitat. During the wet years, the Johansons don't drain their sloughs. And after harvesting in the fall, they plant cover crops that not only build organic matter and keep soil from eroding or blowing away, the crops also provide food for pheasants and deer. Some of the Johansons' farm is left idle in grasslands with wildflowers or forbs mixed in to attract pollinators and insects that pheasant chicks feed on. Cattle graze the grasslands in small fenced off sections for limited periods of time, a method called rotational grazing that preserves habitat. Obviously, um, we, we, everything in our operation we try to do to benefit wildlife. Um, we take great joy in having pheasant numbers on our property and, and anything we can do, the little things can add up to make a big difference. Brady is one of the first dogs in Minnesota to work with the zebra mussels and do that type of detection. He and I work a lot of uh, public accesses and check stations doing detection work. He sniffs out zebra mussels and what we're doing is running him around boats and trailers and uh, once he finds zebra mussels he's trained to sit and he's sitting because he knows he found something that results in him getting his ball. Everything has a unique order but dogs can smell everything a lot uh, better than we can. The dogs are there to prevent the spread. So if he finds zebra mussels that I couldn't find, that's, that's great. We decontaminate that boat and 
send them on their way. It's, they're not a ticket writing tool, it's a, a use uh, to prevent the spread of zebra mussels. Fishermen, recreational boat users, anyone who has watercraft on the lake, the key points to remember are to clean, drain, and dispose. This segment has been brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Big Stone, Candy, Ojai, and Yellow Medicine Counties. A successful pheasant hunt depends on a plentiful supply of birds. Pheasant habitat on private lands, protected by conservation easement programs, has seen a decline. That puts pressure on public land managers to produce more birds on fewer acres. DNR Upland Game researcher Nicole Davros is studying pheasant habitat at the Lamberton Wildlife Management Area in southwest Minnesota. She's looking at what habitat hens prefer for nesting, raising their chicks, and making it through brutal winters. Nicole chose Lamberton for its wide variety of grassland habitats, including a highly diverse plot planted with forbs, commonly known as wildflowers. Nearby is a grassland dominated by big blue stem and a field of switchgrass. Biologists look at native prairie remnants in nine mile squares, based on their observation that pheasants don't move very far in their lifetime. If they move more than two miles in their lifetime, they've made a big movement. Um, most of them stay within about a half mile of where they were born. So from a pheasant life history perspective, where you have good cover, both in terms of grassland cover and winter cover, you should have a lot of birds. And so if you have enough grass and then wetlands and, and, and winter food in that nine square mile complex, then uh, you should have good bird numbers. Birds, bees, and butterflies love diverse prairies with their abundance of forbs like coneflowers and blazing stars. But do the pheasants care? Or are big plots of big blue stem or switchgrass that are cheaper and easier to maintain an adequate home for the ringneck? Is some amount of grass enough? And uh, instead of investing in these forb seeds, you can kind of take that money and maybe work on acquisitions. Nicole's research takes her into the daily life of a hen pheasant. Where does she go to nest? What happens to her chicks? Do they all survive the winter? Hens only live a year and a half to three years tops, so the window into her life is tiny. To track her research subjects, Nicole and her crew catch and collar them. Pheasants are too smart for traps, so she has to catch them when they are vulnerable, bedding down in the grass for a good night's sleep. During cool, dark autumn nights, Nicole and her team of graduate students drive their all-terrain rangers through grasslands to capture young hen pheasants at night, when they are less likely to take flight. They will drive up on the resting pheasants and train the spotlight on them as they try to escape by running through the grass, then quickly jump out of their ATV and trap the young birds in the net. Nicole drives while the crew operates the spotlight and readies the net. When a pheasant is spotted running through the grass, the chase is on. It is not easy to trap a pheasant under the net, especially in thick vegetation where it's often difficult to push the net all the way to the ground so the clever birds can escape. Up here. Got it. The team effort leads to a successful catch. Now the trick is to work the young bird out of the net without harming it or letting it escape. They got him, and he's a beauty. He's a first year rooster. You can see he's not quite pretty yet. <laughs> After they capture a pheasant, the team places a metal identification band on the bird's leg and quickly weighs it. Male pheasants are not part of Nicole's main research, so no radio transmitter will be placed on this young rooster. However, they will put a leg band on him and take some basic measurements before he is released. I don't really expect to recapture too many of them. And I don't expect too many hunters to call them in. We're gonna bag them up and weigh them. You got him? Yep. We've got 
1050. Alright, good luck, little dude. spot another pheasant running in the grass. Again, they kill the headlights and proceed forward with the spotlight alone. Somehow this one eludes them in the tall grass. It's not going to give up without a fight. They get it, and this time it's a young hen. All right. Oh. Is she wrapped around on the back? I think somebody should come in from here. From yeah, I think side. somebody's gonna come from that side. Oh, hang on. Oh. That's a, that's a hen. That's a hen. Got a lot of red. Yeah, there's a lot of variation in them. I needed that. <laughs> I did. I think she's the feistiest one I've been around. The back of the ranger serves as a makeshift field laboratory. Nicole carefully places a radio transmitter around the bird's neck. She'll monitor where the pheasant lives in the study's various grasslands and how long she survives. We just want to be able to fit a pinky in there. So I think I'm actually going to clip off this side first. So yeah, definitely not coming off in enough room to fit a grasshopper down her throat. She has the look of a healthy bird, perhaps the result of growing up in a diverse and plentiful habitat. To ensure that the radio transmitter does not affect the hen's ability to survive, Nicole places it around the bird's neck and adjusts it to exactly the right size so that it won't fall off or get caught up on something. I'm gonna see if I can trim a little more, turn it towards me again if you can. Or I'll just swing it around her. Oh, off that thing. Yeah. The young hen flies away, into the darkness, free again, and no worse for wear. Another data point in this important research on pheasant survival. In the spring, Nicole starts radio tracking her girls. So we're just relying on old-fashioned VHF telemetry. And so we have our antenna. This one here in particular is called a Yagi antenna. And we're actually trying to pinpoint a direction. We use this, this Yagi antenna. And so we use these really nifty little handheld receivers. Um, pretty lightweight and easy to carry. And each hen has a unique frequency. But essentially, we're just going to get a beep, beep, beep that'll tell us that the hen is in a certain direction when we point the antenna that way. To map where the hens are nesting, Nicole uses a process called triangulation and narrows in on six points where beeping is the loudest. We'll use that to say, okay, we think her nest is here, and then we'll wait for her to get into the nesting um, before we approach her, if we approach her. Nicole and crew are careful not to disturb nests that hold the future pheasant population. In the early spring, it takes a hen about two weeks to lay 10 to 12 eggs, then up to 28 days to incubate. If she loses her eggs, she'll lay again, but each attempt can take six weeks for a successful hatch, so the researchers don't want to risk scaring a hen from her nest. 
will rely on the signal to tell us when she's hatching. So we kind of get a little bit of a fluctuation in the signal. It tells me that she's probably hatched. The chicks are bumping into our antenna. And so the sound will be a little bit different. And then we know that we can go after the chicks. When the chicks are hatched, Nicole's crew will try to capture some chicks from each brood and fit them with collars. Like any toddler, they're not easy to catch. They're small, but they're smart. They're, they're born with great survival instincts. And so um, oftentimes they're right under our nose and we don't even know it. But we try to radio track chicks uh, to look at their survival rates and then monitor hens, uh, look at where they're taking their broods to, where are they selecting habitat, and then what is their survival rate in that habitat. So, you know, where do they choose to put their nest sites? Where do they choose to raise their broods? A safe, productive home for pheasants benefits everyone, not just hunters. The deep roots of native grasses stabilize their soils and prevent erosion. Forbes provide habitat for pollinators, songbirds, and beneficial insects. Well, managing for pheasants is really about more than managing for pheasants. It's, it's managing for all the other species that are going to use those grasslands and that are going to use those wetlands. So when you're protecting grasslands, protecting wetlands, you're also protecting habitat for ducks, for frogs, for toads, for muskrats, and for all the other little critters like to run around in the grasslands and the wetlands. Today's recipe, pheasant sausage grind. We're serving that with potato pancakes today. Join me down here on the griddle. I'm starting the potato pancakes. I have a basic recipe, nothing more than egg, hash brown potatoes, plenty of onion. I grew up German, plenty of onion in there, salt and pepper, a little bit of flour, a little bit of baking powder, mix it up. Boom, good to go. Watch for the air bubbles to pop up. Give her a flip. On the other side, we're using our pheasant and our pork. You're going to see we add equal portions of both. To that, we're making this patty. We've added the seasoning. You might have to do a little bit of trial and error to get it to where you want it. But after you've played with it for a little bit, it should come to pass that you'll have something that's just right for you. Now, further to my left, we're going to be doing an apple onion butter. Uh, in this case, what you're seeing here is butter that's melted, apples and onions that I've lightly toasted in the pan already. We're going to add a pinch of honey. This was fresh organic honey that I actually got for Christmas, which makes it that much better. All we want is something that's going to be very nappe or glazed like so that we can put this on top of the material as we plate it up. Now one thing that is optional here is the cinnamon, and I've wrote that in the recipe too. However, when you're doing this at home, if you wish to add a little cinnamon, and then for a little bit of show for the people that are watching you, mix a little bit so that it hits the flames. You'll see it sparks. It has a high flash, or low flash point, I should say. There we go. Now we're ready to plate up here the first meal. So, first comes across, the potato pancakes. Next, the sausage grind. You'll probably want to figure at least four ounces per person when you're doing this. And the last item up for bids is going to be this apple onion butter. The more you cook this, the more those apples are going to reduce. And you want it such as I have here in the pan where there's enough juice here to actually give a little added flavoring to those pancakes. So you'll see the last couple of drizzles. I want that juice to kind of hit the pancakes. Okay? The recipe provided is good enough for two people. There's one portion right there. I hope you give this a try. You asked and we listened. I'm Amanda Anderson, Digital Media Specialist for Prairie Sportsman. The Q&A section of each episode is powered by questions from Prairie Sportsman viewers. Our first question was emailed asking, is there evidence that turkey manure spread over fields could cause bird flu? So my name is Chris Janelle. Uh, I'm a wildlife research scientist at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources in the Wildlife Health Program. 
The answer is yes. Poultry manure contaminated with avian influenza virus that's then spread on fields can result in infection of healthy poultry flocks in the vicinity. A general recommendation is to compost infected droppings inside an affected barn if possible for up to three weeks before applying it to your field to allow time for any virus to be deactivated. Our second question was asked on Facebook using hashtag AskPS. How does Minnesota benefit from ATV tourism and tax dollars? My name is Mary Straka. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I'm the Off-Highway Vehicle Program Consultant. Based on a 2008 University of Minnesota study, approximately $200 million and some 1,434 jobs were supported by direct and indirect spending. No new economic impact studies have been done since 2008 in Minnesota. Question number three was emailed asking, what programs or organizations are dedicated to helping kids get involved with trap leagues and their associated costs? This is Jan Payne, a Montevideo trap team coach. Almost every hunter organization with the exception of Ducks Unlimited is involved in helping support their local trap teams particular Pheasants Forever is a statewide sponsor and most local chapters sponsor local teams. Minnesota Deer Hunters Association is also a statewide sponsor. Nationally, the Midway USA Foundation has an endowment program that is available to any team in the nation. Larry and Brenner Potterfield, the owners of Midway USA Foundations, are tremendous supporters of youth shooting sports programs. Have something to ask Prairie Sportsman? Email questions to prairiesportsman at pioneer.org or use hashtag AskPS on Facebook and Twitter. And visit our blog for more Q&A. Thanks for asking. Thank you for tuning in to Prairie Sportsman. Keep those questions and comments coming in, and be sure to get outdoors this week. Funding for this project was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources and by American Surplus, Ice Castle Fish House RV, Minnesota's largest manufacturer of premium portable ice fish houses and a proud supporter of the annual February Ice Castle Classic Fishing Tournament. More information at icecastlefh.com. Dot com and by live wide open a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in west central minnesota more at livewideopen.com